Professor Boynston is having microphone issues. Is that still the case? Sorry, what was that? Me? Oh, I guess not. No, no, I don't think so. I think I, the Germans are slow, but finally we will make it right. <laughs> they are slow and most reliable. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm watching in amazement what, what is happening to Volkswagen, which is suddenly becoming <laughs> the hot spot. <laughs> you've, seen, you've seen the um, the, the uh, results of the investor day, and today I think it's uh, also again. Uh, I think the uh, quality meeting. I think that they are actually going for Tesla now with quite a quite a strength. So let's see how far we get. But once once the Germans have decided, they normally put some uh, strength into their efforts, right? So we'll see. <laughs> okay. So with that, let me uh, get started. I think we're at time. Um, I wanted to uh, welcome welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Horasis uh, uh, special session on the United States. This is the uh, panel on entrepreneurial clusters nurturing world beating innovation. And uh, we have uh, with us uh, today a distinguished panel. Um, including uh, uh, Mayor Marianne Baldwin, the mayor of uh, the city of, of Raleigh, uh, uh, Sindhu Bhaskar, who is chairman and chief executive officer at EST Global, Eugene Buff, founder and president, primary care innovation consulting, and uh, Anne Wong, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, Suffragen Medical in the uh, U.S. between Boston and South Korea. Uh, and finally, from Europe, uh, from Germany, joining us is Torsten Altman, managing partner at uh, Goli Advisors. So with that, what I'd like to do is uh, welcome everyone. We'll go through a set of questions I prepared. And then, of course, as we get uh, questions from the audience, we can uh, accommodate those uh, as, as they come in. Uh, maybe I'll start by having uh, each of you uh, starting uh, with, with you, Mayor Baldwin, kind of do the one-minute introduction of yourself, your background, and, you know, uh, what you're looking to get out of today's discussion. Oh, boy. Hi, I'm Mary Baldwin. Um, I have been the mayor of Raleigh last year, um, elected um, as COVID hit, and then the rest of what's happened in the world. Um, I was at the city council for 10 years prior. Um, I'm the co-founder of Innovate Raleigh, which is a nonprofit dedicated to um, innovation and entrepreneurship um, in our region. And um, in in this space, we, um, we have a professional city manager that runs the city. Being mayor is a part-time job. So I also work as... Um, for a construction firm, Bar Barnhill Contracting in North Carolina. With so much. Good catch. I was trying to eliminate. Yeah, Eugene. Sorry, I was uh, inviting you to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, and at that point, I, uh, I guess the, the Google decided to restart the browser or something. Uh, thank. Well, uh, my pleasure uh, to be on the panel, and uh, um, I've been around the crisis for a while. So my background is actually biomedical. So I have a medical uh, degree and PhD in genetics. 
but I left the bench science uh, 20 plus years ago. And what I've been doing since is uh, uh, kind of innovation management consulting, uh, which says about nothing. So basically what I try to do uh, with companies, small, large and organization is to help them develop and implement innovation strategy. So it's very uh, all this around the buzz of open innovation. Uh, and also a lot of the matchmaking, uh, uh, so connecting small and large academia and industry uh, globally uh, and across industries. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased with uh, uh, the overall uh, meeting. I've joined the, uh, and listened to some of the planners. So my main goal for uh, being at Horasis is, first of all, again, to, to meet the, uh, more people uh, and to, to learn and hear what's going on in the places that we missed uh, in the last year, because uh, a lot of my work and life was uh, uh, on the both sides of the plane, uh, right? So now we kind of, we missed each other, and, and I think we need to reconnect and uh, 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 make sure that uh, we're still interested to do business together. And uh, Dr. Uh, An Wang, you want to introduce uh, yeah, thank you for um, the, you know, allowing me to participate today. Um, by ways of training, I'm a PhD in engineering, but my day job, I guess, um, by I am a founder to a tissue engineering company where we are commercial. Uh, why I'm participating in this panel is that, you know, Um, what I do to, to do that is I'm an advisor for uh, the Mass Bio Council in town, the Mass Medic Group, and various University. I'm originally from Salt Lake City, and so I'm hoping to expand some of that effort into my hometown as well. So I'm really thrilled to be here today. Okay, and uh, uh, Torsten, would you like to introduce yourself? <coughs> I sure will. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Thorsten, Thorsten Oltmanns. I'm a professor for economics in Germany and Austria, but I'm here today because uh, I'm consulting um, or helping, supporting, on the one hand, governments, uh, especially the German government and the European Commission and the European Parliament, on how to develop innovation clusters. And on the other hand, as soon as the clusters are there, I pretty strongly try to make this uh, known because I think, as the major of Rally will probably tell us later, it's... Uh, one problem is to get the ingredients together, but the other problem is to make people aware of the clusters and the, the hubs and the innovative people and actually draw more innovative people and more money towards a certain place. And then that is, uh, I think, my area of speciality. I, I, I like the idea today exchanging with very, very interesting people, um, kind of uh, making up for the loss of personal contacts a bit, but also learning a lot uh, about how you people do this. And if I can bring across the uh, let's say from my point of view the fact that Europe isn't as that as bad as uh, probably the, some of uh, some of the people in other areas of the world think when it comes to innovation that'll be great actually <laughs> and uh, f finally uh, uh, Dr. Baskar you want to introduce yourself okay I'm Dr. Sindhu Baskar co-chairman and founder of ESG group of companies led by ESG Global Inc. based at Cambridge Innovation Center, MIT, <coughs> MIT Cambridge. We are into digital banking for impact and financial inclusion and working in Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, rather globally from our 16 offices all over. We are focused on composite banking for total inclusion and development through smart agriculture ecosystem for farmers and MSMEs creation of rural wealth through rural exchanges. Today's discussion will give me, of course, an insight into the rigors of growth for such uh, empowering projects vis-a-vis -vis the growth dynamics of Boston Street 128, Silicon Valley and others. And of course, I'm also uh, one of the speakers in Horasis uh, conventions. So uh, talking on US economic history and the growth of uh, fintech in US is a, a great topic. Okay, thank thank you all. Uh, this this should pre prove to be a great discussion. Just in a few words of uh, introduction and then I'll turn it over to questions. Um, uh, just to introduce myself uh, as the audience has joined. 
Uh, Usama Fayyad, I uh, am a chairman and founder of Open Insights. Uh, based out of California, I am also the uh, inaugural uh, executive director of the uh, Institute for uh, Experiential AI uh, at the uh, Northeastern University, and I'm a member of, member of the faculty there as well in computer science. Um, my my background has been uh, uh, mostly technology, and most of my life was at uh, companies like NASA, JPL, uh, Microsoft, Yahoo, uh, several startups. Uh, most recently, uh, also was the global uh, chief data officer at Barclays Bank. Uh, and I've had experiences kind of uh, growing ecosystems both in the in the U.S. in certain places and uh, in the Middle East, um, out of Jordan back in the middle of the uh, uh, what's the so-called Arab Spring. Um, so with that, um, I would like to turn it over to uh, questions. And we'll start with, uh, with uh, Mayor Baldwin. Uh, historically, the, the, the West Coast and, and kind of Northeast Coast of the U.S. have been thought of as the tech innovation hubs. And, and of course, within that even, there's concentrations in like San Francisco, Seattle, uh, New York, and, and Boston. Uh, what, what makes the experience of Rally and, and uh, Research Triangle Park in, in North Carolina in general appealing? And, and what are you building in Rally that existing innovation hubs don't have? So, um, appreciate the question. I, I think one of the reasons why Raleigh is, and RTP are emerging um, as an economic development um, factor is because of RTP. And, you know, RTP started um, in 1950s with the emergence of IBM here. And we have built on that over the years. Um, we currently have the fifth um, largest um, life science um, hub in the United States. Um, we have a number of techno technology powerhouses, um, SAS, um, Cree, Red Hat, Bandwidth, um, Pendo, number of companies that are really emerging globally. And um, I think a lot of the reason for that is our university system. Um, a lot of these companies grew out of um, universities. We have a very strong, what I would say, um, community culture here that supports um, innovation and entrepreneurs. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We've had a number of um, young entrepreneurs move here from um, San Francisco area. Um, the thing that I keep hearing from them is, wow, everyone here wants to help me. They, you know, they want to connect me. They want to, you know, introduce me to this person who can help me. There's a real sense of community and collaboration. And I think that, you know, what they've said is other places, it feels like a competition. Here, it's like, I think people feel like they're all in it together. So, I think it's a combination of um, what we have done intentionally, building on the clusters. We built on what we have, which is life sciences, technology, and healthcare. We have this, we've celebrated our sense of regionalism instead of it being a competitive endeavor. We're all in this together. And I think that that has made um, a difference. But the other thing that's happened, I'd say, over the past 10 years, um, you know, I mentioned that I was co-founder of Innovate Raleigh. You know, that was really a catalyst um, for entrepreneurship in this region. And, you know, now we have over 15 co-working spaces. We have networks that are dedicated to women. Um, Pinkubator um, is, is one locality. Bunker Labs is dedicated to veterans. Um, so, we're really celebrating diversity um, and inclusion, and that's been a core value. So I think for all of those reasons, we're seeing success um, in what we're doing. Thank you, and, and uh, uh, ne never underestimate the, the, the power of diversity. I think it, uh, it can do miracles. Let me switch over to, to Boston from, from North Carolina and, and uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Ann Wong, uh, you know, the, the 
concentrated tech talent in, in, the, head in, in the Boston area uh, kind of would make us expect it to emerge in, in a bigger way as kind of a, a major, major hub. You know, it hasn't gotten to the stage where it's rivaling like Silicon Valley and, and kind of the emerging Seattle. Of course, it's getting there in certain areas in life sciences. Uh, my question to you is, what is your view of Boston versus uh, your effort to move to Salt Lake City and, and build your new startup there? Um, I, we realize there's, you know, family reasons to do that, but also there must be economic and uh, interesting factors that you are considering. Uh, so if you, if you share with us kind of your thinking. Yeah, I, I think when you think through clusters and how every cluster is differentiated, comparing that the same metrics, you know, in Boston, we have some of the top big pharma in the world located here. We have the top research institution located here. And we, because of that, have drawn talent who are specialized in the life science. For that reason, we have this, you know, big life science hub. I would argue that San Francisco, right, they, they their membership is more high tech focused. And for that reason, that's what they're known for. You know, Salt Lake City is a bit different. It's my hometown. We're not known for big pharma. And what we are known for is more of the med tech and genetics, right? So so for that reason, the city, um, you know, a lot of the companies that are growing and, and, and um, doing well in that um, ecosystem is focused in, in that space. Um, but I'm sure, Eugene, uh, you have perspective as well. You're, you're in Boston. Yeah, turning turning over to uh, Dr. Eugene Buff, uh, your experience. I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, that puzzles me, and and of course, no no one understands how these clusters emerge, and we all have our own theories. Uh, you work with with many companies in in many vertical areas uh, across the United States and and elsewhere. Would would love your view and also your commentary on. Kind of one of one of the forces I see, certainly in Silicon Valley where I am, is there's definitely a move, at least on the technology front, of saying, you know, hey, let's base technology out of here. It's just the environment is too difficult, too difficult to retain talent, etc. Would love your point of view, kind of on Boston and your experience across uh, the United States. What, what would be your 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 comments to the to this, and what's your what you, what's your thinking, and also. What, in your opinion, causes these clusters to emerge successfully, if, if you have a theory? Well, so there's so many questions. I, I probably will be the only one talking for the next hour, right? Well, first of all, I, want to, I, I think that we, we're not going to argue here, right? So I think I, I totally agree with uh, uh, everything that's been said, uh, and we haven't prepared in that direction. But, but I want to start from the fact that actually the whole world cluster, right? I think we borrowed it from Germany. Uh, we haven't used that for a while. We we used to be calling all this ecosystem, uh, which is again sounds a little bit fancier, but 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 I guess the difference is minor. But uh, but uh, uh, it does mention. So if if we have the ecosystem, it usually builds around something, around some center, um, and I think that's totally uh, true and very important to understand that all those ecosystems so. Uh, uh, got built around major academic institution or major academic research. So uh, the uh, Silicon Valley wouldn't exist without Stanford. Uh, here in Boston, we got uh, uh, kind of span out this whole innovation out of MIT. Uh, uh, so Research Triangle is uh, definitely the center of crystallization. So I think kind of in, in a way how to build that, I think that's very important. Um, and working a lot with universities, and um, academic tech times, but every single academic institution has some area of expertise. And I think that's potentially the very uh, big and important uh, crystallization center for uh, every, everybody to build up. Um, I'm also totally agree that the uh, both East Coast and West Coast are overly competitive. Uh, and uh, we all heard stories that people really don't want to be. I mean, that's an extra pressure that nobody in the innovation community wants to have. I mean, we were stressed enough. So uh, don't uh, put anything else on us. And also, it's very expensive. You know, here, if, if you know words right here in Boston, everybody wants to be in Kendall Square. 
that's not necessarily true, and especially, I think, in our new economy, whatever the new normal will be when we're out of here, we definitely realize the value of uh, uh, geographical um, distances. We can actually successfully communicate and be productive um, without physically be there. But kind of pulling back, the ecosystem is uh, still very important. Again, and I, I would probably push to use that instead of the cluster because cluster seems to be a little bit more physical. You know, it feels to me it feels like a lot of buildings and uh, uh, um, industrial settings. The ecosystem is a little bit more ephemeric, right? So you have some, uh, I don't know, bees flying in to pollinate uh, the. Uh, explore partnership, um, and then you need to have access to capital um, for sure. But again, back probably uh, to not to the mayor, is you do need to have another component. And in technology transfer, we talk about the triple helix. So the government support and the government infrastructure and the government culture, in the, uh, it's extremely important. So I think if all of those uh, components are in place, uh, we can build those ecosystems or uh, clusters anywhere we want, especially utilizing uh, our new learning of the uh, remote communication. Okay, uh, I'm gonna come back, uh, come back to Boston with, with Dr. Baskar in a second because I think I mean my my role as moderator is is not just to make you get along, but I'm going to emphasize that there there are fundamental disagreements here that I want to go back on, uh, including the fact, well, I'll, I'll get back to that with my question, but I want to move to Europe for a second and uh, and ask uh, 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 Professor Dr. Altman, can you give us the view from Europe and perhaps internationally? We, we haven't seen the kinds of uh, the cubs emerge to the same degree in, in the EU uh, as they have in the US. Uh, despite the fact that, you know, I mean, both, both Anne and Eugene talked about the, the presence of universities being a big force in, in closing these. And, you know, I, I point back to the UK and Germany were probably the centers for higher education and kind of advanced research uh, in, in the early 20th century, for sure. Uh, and, but that didn't seem to have kind of carried through and created the kind of active ecosystem that causes these clusters to emerge. Would love your view and learnings from kind of the experience in, in Europe. What we learn from it for the U.S. Well, that's that's a tough one too. But uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, brief for 45 to 60 minutes. Okay. Uh, no, probably just let, let me let me share two. Um, experiences with you. One thing is, I think there is a certain tendency, and I don't say this to defend Europe and the system, but I think there's a certain tendency to underestimate the innovativeness of uh, Germany, France, the UK. That's because the system is so totally different. I think the main difference is, with all due respect, but I think the, the American way pretty much is centered around gathering capital, one, in order to build up the, the facilities, and secondly, to organize a payback for those who are successful founders, right? And I think the, the, the strength, if there is any, and, and probably even something to learn from is that uh, we, we, the Europeans partly kind of follow a much more incremental approach and the clusters or ecosystems are pretty much centered around established companies, established universities. There's more of them. There's probably less top, top, top universities, but there's a lot of very good universities in all small cities and all areas and especially pretty close to the production facility. So having said that, I think most of the innovative companies actually in Germany, they they are being <coughs> um, kind of built out of universities, but pretty fast in their development actually uh, are close to certain companies, cert to, to certain industries. So the clusters, and there's a lot of them alone, ecosystem of much more than 2,000 companies built around this one big company to develop AI, to develop whatever is needed uh, in terms of, of sustainable driving. And they are pretty much connected to the 
mother company in a way, right? So we don't see them out there. They are not out of the markets looking for capital. They are working already in an ecosystem that is pretty closed. So I think that that's one of the things and that makes, with all due respect, I think <clears throat> the classical way of organizing private equity or venture capital obviously find some boundaries, right? You are, Normally you'd say you'd invest in 100 companies. There's about 10 of them who actually don't fail. And there's probably, if you are lucky, one unicorn. And I think we have a much lesser rate of failure uh, in the system because uh, the moment a company kind of adopts your ideas or a bigger cluster, there's much more likeliness of, uh, of succeeding at the market and coming up with something that's successful on the market in connection to something that's already there. And uh, just... Probably a last remark, I think uh, founders in Europe are normally older than they are in the US. That is widely seen as a disadvantage, but Harvard just recently published a study that the, um, the probability to succeed with your startup is four to five times bigger for people even beyond their 40s and 50s than there is with 20s. So the entire system from the European perspective in other parts of the world seems to be then you kind of target and sometimes be successful with other people's money. Whereas in, uh, in Germany and in Western Europe, the system is pretty much more around um, companies, funding uh, startups and innovative ideas. Okay. Now that's a, that's a, that's an interesting, interesting twist on the theory, kind of the, uh, serving serving an existing closed ecosystem as opposed to trying to target uh, the world more more visibly, uh, which we I agree we should not discount. Uh, doc, Dr. Baskar, a question to you. Uh, you know, both again help us understand this puzzle uh, of you know you, you have experience in, in in Boston area of course and you have experience uh, internationally. Um, you know, how do you how do you feel about this whole theory around? I mean, I would say in the United States, of course, Boston was probably the premier first spot where we got the amazing universities uh, with amazing concentration, etc. Uh, yet that wasn't enough to, to make it compete with a place like Silicon Valley, which looked like the backwaters back when it first emerged. So we'd love kind of your view and, and your ideas in terms of uh, how to make these clusters emerge. Well, uh, Silicon Valley and uh, uh, Boston Street 128 region both emerged as the main uh, uh, tech region of uh, U.S. But only, uh, I think, Silicon Valley uh, could shake off the yoke of loss of uh, semiconductor dominance to Japan and diversified into other PCs and workstations, while Boston Street 128 stuck to their style. So it is basically the problem was uh, it, uh, the uh, orientation towards change, how they are going to accept and adopt the change was the uh, differentiating factor. Like uh, if you see the saga of uh, Apollo computers and Sun Microsystem, how they developed and how they grew, uh, it will show the uh, lack of relevant co uh, corporate culture in Boston Street 128 region. I'm not trying to be uh, critical in offensive manner, but I'm just trying to uh, show that why it all happened. Because Boston, uh, of course, backed by great uh, educational institutions, research facility and everything, it had an, uh, a re like uh, independent company based system, so more inward looking and company keeping it to itself it had proximity to uh, government headquarters was Washington DC. It was working with defense policies. So it was more towards secretive nature and creating a centralized uh, administrative structure. Everything trickling down from top to bottom. So filtration theory type of structure was there. So that's why it could not adopt very quickly to the changing times and they could not read it. They probably thought that, okay, if we keep on continuing with it, it is a matter of time, everything will get changed and we'll be back into the saddle. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it did not happen. And uh, uh, the uh, regional network-based system of uh, Silicon Valley was definitely a bigger hit because uh, it, it had a giant social networking site 
all the like um, uh, uh, workers and uh, tech guys who were there they were interacting with each other they were exchanging ideas there was no fear of uh, ex- exchanging ideas also so they were constantly educating themselves trying to uh, upgrade themselves with newer ideas and of course uh, the companies were growing bigger and bigger so they uh, started emerging as patrons for all these uh, elements and that created a different atmosphere of adoption and adaptation to uh, all the new technologies and a new learning culture culture so the interactive model of society peer interaction peer competition uh, peer learning from each other and possibility of uh, faster job uh, hopping was the most distinctive style of uh, i should say the silicon valley culture the same thing started like uh, uh, seattle also wants to come uh, has already attained a good position now with the vc culture and availability of huge cash and some of the top uh, companies are there now with microsoft and uh, facebook and all those so they are uh, like a benign uh, and very uh, helping uh, edifice trying to promote more startups and trying to uh, uh, cooperate with them at every stage so that they can really contribute them to grow bigger and bigger now that is another angle which is coming up with this vc model so there is more focus on profitability there is more focus on how you have to uh, uh, emerge as a big cartel and uh, as a big company so again the latest factor in the technology is coming up with that how it is going to change the society in the next 4 5 years or say 10 years uh, very difficult to say but uh, it is going to be very very competitive but it doesn't mean that boston has lost its appeal the tremendous education and the research capability has given it the uh, highest position in all this uh, medical industry and biotech and all that so that cannot be taken over by silicon valley even if they keep on trying because the nature of their uh, industry and characteristic is totally different it's a very nimble uh, for that type of thing and uh, boston is more towards long term policy uh, sustained policy and inward looking thing so that's the basic difference which is going on yeah thank you thank you let me let me turn to uh uh mayor baldwin and then back to ann so you you've heard you've heard these different kind of uh, uh theories ideas as to uh the emergence of these clusters but what what we'd love to learn is and i in your introductory remarks you mentioned you were you you did things intentionally with with planning and kind of concentration we we'd love to get a feeling for uh you know how do you do that what have you done uh and and what what makes it different from you know a, w- the environment is 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 friendly and the weather is nice that's great but uh the, the other side is you know what have you done intentionally to kind of uh, make this happen and what, more importantly what would you do going forward so yes i think intentionality is the key to all of this this just doesn't happen it has to be worked at all the time and i think part of it is the way we have our economic development system structured again i'm going to go back to collaboration people working together not competitively i think that that has given us um an advantage um working with our universities um we have here the university um of north carolina at chapel hill duke university NC State University is right here in Raleigh but in Raleigh we also have William Peace University um Meredith University which is a women's um college we have two HBCUs Shaw University and St. Augs and Augustans and then we also have a fantastic community college system but Wake Tech is right in our backyard we all work together um So I'll give an example. Wake Tech runs a pro- program called Launch Raleigh. It is focused on helping people of color and women 
create businesses. Now, it's come out of Wake Tech, so they get the training, whatnot, but they also get mentors. The city has helped support this program. Um, we have put money into it, um, and I think putting putting um, money where your mouth is is an important piece of this as well. Um, providing the support. I'll give another example. There's a group called District um, C here, and they work with public high school students. Um, they actually did a project with William Peace and um, the winning student um, would get a scholarship, $18,000 scholarship to William Peace. That's the type of thing that we're focusing on. How do we dive deeper? We How do we get um, high school students interested in innovation and entrepreneurship? How do we set that expectation and stage? So it's not just about what we're doing um, or what we have done. It's about what we can do better. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, no I mean, defi definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, this, this intentionality is, is something we, we need to think about and kind of the, the determination and the funding, the, the growing of the VC community, which is also critical in addition to education. Sorry, you had something more to say. You know, and one other thing is really important too, and that's creating a front door for innovation and entrepreneurship. So one of the things that we did um, when I was on the city council, we had a person who was dedicated to innovation and entrepreneurship. That person was the connector. People knew when they came to Raleigh, that was the front front door. That's who you went to. Innovate Raleigh has kind of taken over that role, but having that front door, whether it's your state government, your local government, um, or some type of entity, guiding people, making sure they know where to get help, I think that that is really important as well. Great, great, thank you. Uh, let me uh, ask a question to, to Dr. Wang and, and, and all, actually, but we'll start with, with An. Um, we've seen a lot of innovation in healthcare in the last few years, especially during the coronavirus. But the question I have is in terms of your view, does, does the U.S. face systemic or policy barriers that make innovation in healthcare more difficult than, than in other countries uh, or not? Uh, what, what should healthcare tech startups keep in mind? Where's the right place for a for a healthcare tech startup? Does it have to be in one of these tech hubs? Does it have a strong chance if it's outside? Oh, I feel like that's a baited question, but I'll keep this PC. Um, no, I, I think when you work, uh, unlike working in life science versus you know the, the high tech, right, San Francisco versus Boston, in the life science, if you mess up, somebody can die, right? Because we're dealing with healthcare and, and medicine. So for that reason, we're heavily regulated. So I, if from my, you know, not representing anyone here, but so from my perspective, I think the regulations and barrier in place is to protect consumers, right? And and in, in the past, there's this been this perception that it's easier to get a CE mark, but I don't think that's true anymore, right? In Europe, the same barriers, and then I think those are um, really great uh, to be in place. Are, are there. So I don't think it's any easier now to get something approved all U.S. than it is in, in, in the U.S. And then obviously there's, you know, take that with a grain of salt. There's a lot of exceptions. But um, I think to be successful in the life science regulated spaces, you need a lot more support. Right. So going back to Mayor Baldwin, I completely agree. It needs to be intentional. So unlike what Dr. Um, Toysen said about Europe, where the entrepreneur makeup is a lot older, and that older to me implies more experience, right? So for us to be successful for with younger entrepreneur, we as an ecosystem need to provide those support, and those supports are mentors who've done it, right? Excel programs to help them think through the financial structures and legal structures, educations, and and so for example, in Boston, there's a lot of groups that have stepped up for this. The Mass Medic, for example, is putting together a whole program on how do you you know, um, think through clinical studies and then what are the laws and everything required for it, right? And the state of Massachusetts is putting money into getting more kids into STEM education, for an example. So I, I believe to be successful in the life science space, the way Boston has been, and obviously Boston has had a head start, right? 
you know, this has been 50 years or so of, of building this ecosystem. Uh, it was done, you know, intentionally with a lot of, you know, um, governmental in intervention, trade groups coming in. And as we build out that ecosystem, more people have more at stake. So there's more, like like myself, more willing to give back to, to maintain that structure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me let me ask this question, which is more general and hopefully and again, a reminder to the audience, we have less than 10 minutes left. If you have any questions, please uh, post them in the chat and we, we will uh, we will uh, take care of them. Um, here's a question, perhaps uh, maybe targeted a bit at Torsten, but but also at everybody. Um, any views on the emergence of China as a as a formidable hub for tech and AI in particular? Uh, we've seen a transition from kind of catch up tech to actually uh, leadership begin to take place in, in, in that technology. Um, should, should the U.S. be alarmed? Uh, by the way, I mean, I, I, I have kind of seen this movie before with, with Japan back in the before the second AI winter happened, where the U.S. was very alarmed about the fifth generation systems effort by, by Japan. But what do you think about uh, what do you think about China and what do you think about what's happening there? Uh, also thinking about intentionality. I mean, that's probably an extreme version of intentionality. Uh, maybe, Torsten, you can start and anybody else who has views, please. Yeah, I've been part of a project actually to uh, assess the Chinese uh, innovation landscape, so to say, or the ecosystem. And my, my takeaway from that is other than with the Japan, I think, which to my opinion was pretty directional and even authoritative system or something, the Chinese make for a very good mixture, I think, of the American and the Western European approach, from my point of view. Combined. Oh, we, we think we lost him for a second. <laughs> so anybody else care to weigh in on, on China? Yeah, I, 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 I oh, yeah, Maybe Eugene, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Eugene. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just had a few things. Uh, I've uh, dealt with uh, Chinese companies on both, again, kind of uh, buy side and sell side, meaning kind of trying to introduce technology into China and backwards. Uh, and, and there is a very uh, strong push uh, that I've heard on official level that they want to change their perception in the world from made in China to invented in China. So, uh, again, probably uh, supporting to what uh, Kirsten was supposed to say about the government uh, is very strongly supporting what they're trying to do. Uh, they do need to catch up, obviously, on the intellectual property uh, um, kind of legality and laws. Um, and also another thing that I, I, I think that they are missing, again, probably uh, mirroring into what uh, you were trying to say, is that I think the China does lack this directionality. Uh, so they're really not sure where they're going. Uh, so they have a lot of mixed uh, expertise and uh, knowledge. Uh, so they try to embrace everything. Um, and uh, uh, that says that probably in the very near future, nothing dramatic will happen. Because if you spread your effort uh, too thin, uh, you probably do. But, but the power is there. So if they figure out and decide uh, what they really want to do, I'm sure they have the capability and the intellectual and the, uh, monetary capital. That's, a, that's an inter interesting observation, in intentionality without necessarily directionality. Uh, let's, uh, uh, Dr. Baskar, uh, Torsten, you got cut off in the middle. Any kind yes. of one-minute summary of what you were going to say, and then we turn to Dr. Baskar, and then I want to go okay. to my Let, Let's try. I was turned off the moment I mentioned China, I think. So <laughs> I, I, I would be pretty worried, uh, just um, other than Eugene said, because I think they have a very good mixture of uh, central planning and uh, kind of letting loose the individual uh, ability and, and the eagerness and even the greed. I think they make a lot of uh, uh, out of the greed of people, which is in a way combining the European and the American approach. And as far as I know, there's a lot of, lot of focal points where very good people meet. They have great universities and a lot of great people, just given the sheer amount of people that are there. So what, from what I can see and what I've seen, in terms of AI, in terms of the next step, like, you know, kind of uh, integrating computer services, which sounds like sci-fi sci a little bit more to the brain directly without any keyboards or stuff like that. They are definitely actually uh, far ahead of what I know from the West. Dr. Baskar, you, you were going to say something, maybe one minute? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah uh, I will consider it as a reverse brain drain which they created for China so that they could develop the real AI power, because 
everything is geared to party and party means uh, uh, dominance uh, by way of uh, army and economic dominance so that is why whatever they are trying to do is trying to prove their uh, superiority and the uh, basis goes back to the time of opium war and uh, colonization of china wherein it was so badly humbled and no um, um, uh, technology was made available to them so with a vengeance they are taking charge of that uh, technology and ai to prove their superiority and create the a virtual trough in china so that no one can penetrate and everyone has to be afraid of you can see what happened in south china sea when they uh, uh, planted themselves there even us could not do anything and after couple of months also do you think the us can do anything nothing so they are more dangerous their techno uh, uh, technical superiority is more more dangerous than anything else and of course that means to uh, total subjugation of world china versus the rest of the world that is how it is going to go I mean, so uh, uh, us is included there <laughs> this has been a, a a great discussion thank you and, and let me end with kind of one sentence each um you know what's what's the key theme you'd like the audience to keep in mind as they leave this session starting with you maybe mayor baldwin then uh, ann eugene torsten and and uh, dr baskar yep so i talked a lot about intentionality today but now i have a new one intentionality in directionality <laughs> i mean having having the the right direction um but also again be authentic be who you are don't try to be something you're not build on your strengths and um and just it takes hard work great on huh? i think it takes a community so you should